Warning, the following Otaku Generation podcast has content of an adult and mature nature and is not necessarily safe for work or appropriate for children under the age of 18. If you are easily offended by content of this type, please stop this recording. Parental discretion is advised. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Otaku Generation are those of the cast and crew and the individuals that express them and are not necessarily associated with the sponsors or guests of the show. Otaku Generation is a Red Apple production which is solely responsible for its content. All impressions are poorly impersonated. And please, for the love of God, don't try this at home. Hi, I'm Jennifer Scheiman of Angry Alien Productions, and you're listening to Otaku Generation. Well, welcome to Otaku Generation. generation. Next generation radio for otaku. <laughs> Our podcast brings all the otaku to the yard. Hey, look, we're not in con withdrawal. You're in con withdrawal. I mean, it's not like we made a security blanket out of con t-shirts or anything. I mean, we're still podcasting from OGNetworks.tv in a basement where get your own security blanket. This is ours. Show number 739, August 7th, 2019. With this week's topic, Dororo. And now... Reasons not to say Dororo five times fast. Number one, people think you're talking about Durarara. Number two, spontaneous row, row, row your boat sing-alongs. Number three, tongue explodes. Number four, Japanese version of ooh la la. And number five, Gozer appears to destroy us. And now, someone who is sure he checked the recorder this time, Alan Chase. Hey, Matt, how's it going? <laughs> Uh, it's going pretty good. Going all right. Yeah. So uh, I, I think we we did describe it last last week. Yeah, yeah. So Sam and I sort of gave our, our basic recap conversation piece about Otakon. So hopefully we'll recapture some of that from uh, from Paul and Bryce. But anyway, you know, hi, hello, everyone. I'm Alan. I'm Matt. I'm Bryce. And I am Paul. Yes, indeed. Um, so that is sort of our monthly crew for for this week. Um, okay, so... Uh, I'm not motley, I'm musty. What's freesh? What's bang? What's squeak with the OG crew? Indeed. Uh, I am still a con sick. <laughs> <laughs> or allergy sick I don't I don't know which um so what what has gone on with me uh, I finally saw Spider-Man Far From Home um I saw it with Matt and Simon I'm sure that'll be a conversation in a moment um I started watching something uh per Simon's um suggestion and at first I didn't know it was Simon's suggestion and then I put it together oglink.com 4GO. That'll take you over to Netflix. The show is called Kim's Convenience. It's sort of funny um, about a Korean grocery store and a family. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, it comes highly recommended from Simon and certainly from me as well. Uh, enough that I watched it up to season two so far. <laughs> Not through season, season two. I'm still in the middle of it. But mm. uh, 13 episodes a season. That's true for at least the first and the second, and there's a third season also available on Netflix. It's kind of funny. If you can't make it through the first episode of the first season, then obviously the show isn't for you. Um, but that's the level of humor that you're basically going to get, if not more. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I thought it was uh, pretty fun and um, sort of in my illness this weekend. I've been watching a little too much of it. Yeah, probably a little too much of it. So, um, yeah, so I don't know. I think there was a ton of other stuff since, like, seasonal review. I think I'm up on all the Wicks except three. I'm up on all the Spider-Mans now. Um, I enjoy this reboot, the Marvel reboot, that is. Not the, uh, you know, the other other ones from previously. So, in comparison, this is pretty good. Uh, so, if you haven't seen the latest, you know, Hon- Homecoming and Far From Home, you should. Should. Mm-hmm. Should see it. Okay, so moving on for me, Matt, what about you? Uh, what's been going on? Uh, well, let's see. Aside from seeing Spider-Man uh, Far From Home, not too much. I've uh, been kind of wrapped up with real-life issues. Um, but uh, would definitely agree with Alan. Spider-Man Far From Home, really good. If mm-hmm. uh, if you like Marvel movies, definitely go see it. Yeah. Um, but uh, aside from that, missed out on Otakon, so not much to say about that. Mm-hmm. So let's uh, just move on to Bryce and see if he has anything to say about Otakon. Yeah, what about you, Bryce? Otakon was fun. Moving on. No. <laughs> um, 
I I need to make a link to your music video that you yeah. released. That was I, fun. I will do that. Oh, you made a new video, right? Yeah, first time in 11 years. Smith Woo-hoo. Oticon made the finals. Pretty good about that. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, it was cool. It's a rush you don't get you get from seeing your video on the screen. It's very fun. Uh, it's been a long time. <laughs> How was the uh, audience reaction to it? Decent, I think. No one walked out, I don't think. So it's been, it's, <laughs> there were more people than I thought in the actual room. I thought it was, it seemed small at first, but I guess maybe people trickled in as the time went by. Uh, well, there's like 700 people in there or something like that. So Yeah, that's Counts that's one of the, the common uh, impressions that I've been getting from people is that since moving to the bigger convention center, um, the con feels like very empty compared to like the, the sardine tin that it used to be in the Baltimore convention center. So even when you have... Yeah. As many people, or maybe more people, as you had in Baltimore, the the space is big enough to accommodate them, so they don't seem quite so jam packed in there. Yeah, which I guess I prefer. <laughs> or yeah, <laughs> taking twenty minutes to get from one end of the con to the other. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah I would not want that back. Um, yeah, in, in the Baltimore Convention Center, every time somebody stopped to take a cosplay photo in the hallway, like the whole thing just backed up. Yeah, in in our first recording, I kind of referred to this as what, what did I call it? like cosplay husbands? Uh, what? Yeah, so this is like where the group of individuals uh, make sure they have a dedicated photographer to them, and like a uh, handler, basically. Yeah, yeah. basically, yeah. Well, sort well. of like a yeah. a Renfield to their Dracula. You give them some space for their angel wings, like backup people. You know? <laughs> um, well, it wasn't even that. Um, the biggest issue for me was in the mezzanine in the marquee. It's really beautiful up on mm-hmm. that level. And it's marble everywhere. It's just, it's just sort of like atrium. It's, it's fantastic looking. The problem is everyone is sort of creeping around, blocking every li- that big space, like in every nook and cranny with their dedicated photographer. And, oh, uh, because it's so photogenic. Yeah. Everybody wants to do mm-hmm. shoots there. And they, there's so much um, depth. There's so much space there. Mm-hmm. Literally, people are taking across like the whole. The picture is, isn't is just a individual inside with background. It's like in an isolated, big in the big space, mm-hmm. them taking up sort of an isolated chunk of it and just sort of, um, uh, you know, as an individual, not blocking, but c- collectively sort of making it very difficult even like on the sort of the back side beyond the planters the you know they're sort of hitting every little nook and cranny beyond that and to alice's point yeah because press relations was in front of of the planters which had ferns in them uh-huh. um people were taking pictures of creeping through looking through the fern leaves and taking yeah. their pictures that way using yeah. them as props yeah and they were sort of doing it very exclusively in front of her press relations <laughs> office <laughs> yep yep and so um I, look i so was alice looks out the window there's just these like cosplayers yeah, sneaking around she, she was yeah she's like in the ferns yeah she's like they keep creeping on us <laughs> through the ferns and i go oh yeah that makes a lot of I, sense i don't think they were interested in press relations they wanted the ferns yeah um oglink.com <laughs> slash uh 4gp to get to bryce's amv mm-hmm. on youtube Yep, I'll probably load up my back catalog at this point now. Yeah, I mean, I <laughs> thought about yeah, go ahead. Do I it. thought about doing something like that. I had sort of didn't do it for a very long time because it was sort of like a no-no thing uh, in yeah, terms but, of yeah, copyright. But it <laughs> it seems to be pretty abused. I mean, you can find a playlist of the entire contest now. People have assembled, so yeah, it's a uh, good contest though. A lot of good videos. Uh huh. Um, once you cut down, like you don't really realize it during the pre-screening, but once you cut out six hours of stuff and you get the the best stuff usually it's actually a very entertaining two hours of yeah. oh good <laughs> so yeah where did you uh did you see it in the theater room or did you see it in main events, I was main events yeah I, I know they did a simulcast in the theater but i didn't spend much time in the theater all weekend but mostly did a lot of shopping uh Aris alley was pretty good mm-hmm. as usual dealers room picked up a couple figurines uh, what else did we really do though um did you catch any good panels I only went to one panel the whole time, and it was this one about, it was called, like, the anime openings the man doesn't want you to see, and I guess it's, like, <laughs> I guess it's, it's basically licensing issues where, like, they oh. originally broadcasted an opening, and then when it came out over here, or it was released on home video in Japan, they couldn't get the rights to the song again, so they had to come up with a different opening. Oh, yeah, I know that like, happened with uh, Speed Grapher, right? Yeah, that was actually the first video he put out, yeah, yeah. because it, Duran Duran's Girl on Film is the opening in Japan, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then they couldn't license the rights to or it was too expensive yeah. to license it in the U.S., so they 
Yeah. I don't know. Forget what they were substituted for it. They put in some like uh, if I remember, they put in some like weird, kind of generic mm-hmm. like insert song from that. Yeah, anime. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it's a cool opening. <coughs> they put it to Duran Duran, but and there was another one. I, the Kadocha opening, the first that was is actually technically was not brought out over here either. They had a different really? song. Yeah, wow, which is weird because like that's the only opening I know. That one where like it's you know rocking well, out and she's like going super fast. Yeah, like the bats playing guitar and jumping the drums. Yeah, because you saw you saw the the fan subs that I had. Yeah, so I never watched the DVD releases they put out here. Right. Yeah. So that was kind of interesting panel, but not I wouldn't say amazing panel. I couldn't tell you who put it on though. What else did I do? Okay. But yeah, a lot of shopping really is what I did. It's kind of the way you know. We have a, we have a new apartment and my girlfriend, so we got some wall space to put up. So Yay. I'll give it to I'll, uh, one artist I did like. Uh, I bought a piece from is uh, goes by the name Ashley Riot. Mm-hmm. Um, you like look up Ashley Riot and then like artists, it'll pull, her portfolio will pop up. And it's a uh, I picked it like an original piece actually that had nothing. It wasn't from anything, and I didn't really realize that. I was like, is this from anything? Because it looks great. And mm-hmm. they're like, yeah, I'll take a print. Uh, yeah, this is a cool, like, kind of cyberpunk-looking uh, shot. But she does also um, art of, like, actual anime and video games. So I was very impressed. Hmm. Other than that, um, yeah, what else did we do? I mean, me and Paul and Albert hung out, uh, got dinner a couple yeah, nights. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> me and Albert watched, uh, on what the first night we watched, we got back, we watched really bad Dragon Ball dub, like the original dub-dub for Toonami or whatever. Oh, that's yeah. so bad, but it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> that's the one where, like, Vegeta, like, that's the one where, like, Krillin goes, like, the, Goku's healing up in this tank, and, like, you know, Vegeta explains it's going to heal him, and Krillin goes, that's Mondo cool. And then Vegeta's head goes, that's right, boys, Mondo cool. <laughs> it's, like, oh. it's real good. But also very bad. Um... <laughs> And then we watched the fifth of North Star movie the second night um, on Blu-ray, and that I got more into it than I thought I was going to. As someone that doesn't know much about Fifth of North Star, then you're already dead. <laughs> is the mm-hmm. only thing I know about Fifth of North Star, and that he also you know touches you in places and you explode a few seconds later. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was fun. Uh, it's you know a violent one. It's Fifth of North Star. I think you know what you're getting into if you decide to watch that. <laughs> I'm more of a JoJo guy though. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's it for the con for me. Really, I can't think of too much else I did. Um, I did pick up the new Fire Emblem Three Houses for Switch. Oh, it's very, yeah, it's very good. Uh-huh. I uh, I I haven't done that yet. It's intense though. There's a lot of mechanics going on, oh, but okay. it's very good. Uh, it, they borrow a lot from Persona, which in, as far as like the outside the battle uh, stuff, but the, it looks great. You know, the, it, the last per- Fire Emblem game was on the <coughs> on the uh, we don't count that brawler, but the real true Fire Emblem game was on the 3DS. So now mm-hmm. they have an HD console. Looks great. <laughs> like, it's really nice to see those characters not be like kind of squatty little guys and more. You know, like an anime character that you'd want to see, you know, fully acting out their attacks. Uh, Harlem Three Houses is good. You sort of pick, it's a, you're a teacher at a church slash, like, school, and there's, like, three houses, and you kind of choose which one you want to be the professor of. And a little Harry Potter in there, actually. Yeah. I went with the Black Lion, or Black, Black, Black Eagles, yeah. The Black mm-hmm. Eagle House, which apparently that's the one everyone's picking because I think, probably because the head is like the the noble who's like the head of the whole house also is very cool hmm. the silver herald uh, girl fights with an axe she's pretty awesome uh, but the other two houses are also look interesting I just didn't want to I just it seemed like the best one to me and there's like c- certain students that are in the in the house and those are the ones you're going to sort of train initially and you sort of instruct classes build your bonds with them and they up their stats by like teaching them hmm. archery that week and there's a lot of time management in that way that's where they kind of get the persona vibes from hmm Okay, but it also you can also recruit if you like if you can get the right stat like if you increase your archery and your dexterity let's say you can recruit somebody who is, has that from another house to come into your house and use them as also um, a unit in battle. Uh, I know this. I don't know much. I know there's a, at some point there's going to be a time skip, but I know the implications of who you recruited has a big effect on the story after that. But I don't know much else beyond that. So, uh, but it's good. A few hours in, uh, probably like six hours in now. Uh, yeah, it's a good Fire Emblem game. Probably my favorite since Awakening. Uh, Fate was good, but not that much different than Awakening. Yeah, and I'm trying to remember what I played back on my 3DS. Probably Awakening. Or, or uh, on the GBA, maybe. Or no, no, DS. no. It was definitely on the uh, the DS, actually. Right, yeah, that could have been the yeah. remake of the original. Right, I think yeah. that's what it was. Because I knew it wasn't the original. Um, I knew it was something different. Yeah. Um, but I still enjoyed it, nevertheless. Yeah, I mean, the original came out here as far as I know. It was like a Super Nintendo game, maybe? Because mm-hmm. uh, they were not putting Fire Emblem out here for a long time. Um, but they eventually got around to doing it, which is good. Cause it's a good series. Uh, still, there's you can turn off Permadeath. It's not the, but uh, let's say it's not the hardest game in the world right now. 
Uh, so I haven't really issues where my characters are dying and have the safe scum. And actually, they put they built in a rewind feature if you want to like go back a few turns mm-hmm. if something goes real bad. You can't. It's, there's a limit to how much you can use it in a battle, but it's kind of like your safety net in case you're like, oh, I did a real dumb move there. Right, because it's permadeath. <laughs> yeah, you can turn the permadeath off though if you want. <laughs> uh, I like to keep it on because it like, makes me not like run into battle like a crazy person to sacrifice people to kill. Like, you know, uh, so. Hmm. Uh, uh, <laughs> I haven't paid for it yet. I've start, I started the free trial for Final Fantasy XIV. I saw everybody going bonkers for it. And I never played an MMO before. Uh, but I don't, I'm not that far in. I don't much to say about it yet. But it's, let's just say I appreciate the Final Fantasy tone and aesthetic more than I appreciate a Warcraft tone and aesthetic. So that alone mm-hmm. has made me more interested in this than Warcraft, uh, World of Warcraft ever would. Um, okay. So and I don't really know what... I don't know about MMOs to so know what mechanics are in all of them. Like what's, what this one's doing unique. So I can't really comment in that regard. Um, so, I don't know. I'll talk more about it next week, but once I get farther in, uh, okay. it's free, yeah. Um, how, yeah, does yeah. It, how does it look? It looks better than it looks actually pretty good for an MMO. Like, from my pictures I've seen, it's like World of Warcraft. It's a right. step above that for sure. Where are you, where are you playing this? On my PC. Okay. Uh, with a controller and also using my mouse for other things. So, my typical battle, I'll use the controller because if I have to like go do menu stuff, I'll grab the mouse. Mm-hmm. Works out pretty well. Yeah. Uh, it's free to level 35, and after that, you have to pay the, the monthly fee, and then. Is this, this last expansion they put out like really got everybody really positive on it again and that enough for me to like okay fine I'll see what it's like and if I'm gonna get an MMO it's probably gonna be this one so this is the best shot I got <laughs> uh, so that's about it okay Paul what about you and uh, what about me and uh, how was your Oticon even though we had discussed yeah. this last week <laughs> yeah yeah, cast our minds back into the very, very recent past. No, it was good. Um, it's always a good time. Um, I have to say, uh, you know, as mentioned, the Walter E. Washington Convention Center uh, just soaks up the people. I mean, it does not feel like there were 30,000 people there. Well, that's a and, good thing. And uh, no, a lot of the panels yeah. felt, felt almost empty. Like, uh, it, it felt like um, the MV Theater wasn't as busy this year, at least when I was there. Um, main events did not feel packed for things like, you know, the AMV competition. Uh, but clearly the people were there and like on Saturday night, particularly, uh, everything was thronging. So I wonder if uh, the introduction of the one day passes maybe changed some of the distribution a little bit. Uh, yeah, they reintroduced trial memberships this year for people who, who only wanted to come for one day. And I'm assuming that would lead to a big surge on Saturday, which is always, the most popular day and it's also the day that most people are usually able to get free from their schedules right also i mean the best value is to commit for a three day it yeah re- it really is um i know some but, people but just sometimes come on. people just just can't make it for the whole weekend right. which is no, sad. I, I understand that especially if you're a local mm-hmm. um i i totally understand that frame of mind obviously for us who are out of towners, we are committing, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. We're committing full on, so we're not sort of half coming in and half let leaving. It it makes no sense to do anything like that. So, yeah, you're you're not going to drive two and a half hours each way for a day trip, right? It's not going to yeah. be a five hour thing just to get access to the dealer's room. Like it, that doesn't make any sense. Mm. Um. So I'm sorry, Paul. We we <laughs> interrupted what you were saying. No, that, not at all. That's we're, we're talking about the con, so it's all the con. Um, I think one of the highlights was uh, the Penguin Highway movie, uh, which I have to, which I went into intending to just like catch a half hour of to see if I uh, enjoyed it, and I w- because I was extremely hungry at the time and ended up staying for the full two hours. Um, <laughs> It's kind of an interesting, I, I, I mean, I think uh, maybe Simon talked about this uh, last week, mm-hmm. uh, because I know Simon likes this one as well, though I think he'd, uh, did he, I think he saw it in the previews before uh, the convention actually started up. Uh, but yes, I would definitely recommend this one. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say it's flawless, but it's got sort of a, a whimsical character to it, uh, strong characters, and it's just got, you know, sort of a, a pleasant, mild surrealism to it, or magical realism, perhaps, or just mm. magical uh, magic intervening into everyday life. Uh, is it a is it directed by somebody who's done other stuff? I don't know much about this. Uh, actually, I'm not. It was um, as I recall the the uh, the person from the uh, the licensor eleven is it eleven eyes um, that the, stood up and said that it was basically a first time director. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking at my MDB. It looks like he's a lot of stuff like um, like at one point he was a background artist or a key animator and stuff like that. So I guess it's his first time. 
Right. Yeah, it's a Studio Colorido, who I didn't know either. Um, oh, Eleven Arts. That was that's the uh, North American licensor. So uh, it actually was released, and I did not realize until after the con that it was actually available for sale at the con. So I'm kind of wishing that I'd picked up a copy of that uh, because it's pretty good, and we probably ought to do a show on it at some point. Oh, okay. Foreshadowing. I, or I picked anything. up two things for us to do a show on as well. Yeah, ones like that. What is it? What Space Adventure Cobra movie? I want to watch that and talk about it. I don't know anything about this guy. I just want to know. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I saw that on Discord. I was like, uh huh, that that's gonna be a topic. <laughs> Uh, so, so the big buzz uh, as far as movies at the con, though, was Promare, uh, which is the new Studio Trigger movie. Yeah. And I did not brave the lines for that, which were, you know, there was like a line to line up for the line two hours in advance. <laughs> and I was not at line con this year. Uh, and apparently it was actually reasonable and you could make it in. Uh, so but I did not uh, I didn't roll those dice. But everybody who went that I talked to said it was just every it was sort of like trigger distill the best of all their movies. Um, so that's definitely one that I need to chase down. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of I'm kind of hoping that maybe it will get a screening somewhere because I imagine that would be a real treat to see on the big screen. OK, cool. Uh, yeah, let's yeah, see what we'll... else. Uh, so my wife was along. Uh, she sort of dropped in and out of the con. She's not really an anime person, but she enjoys a lot of the Japanese culture stuff. Uh, she really enjoyed the dealer's room. Uh, observed that a lot of the dealers had more sort of general uh, Japanese merchandise, mm-hmm. you know, things like notebooks and so on, yeah. uh, which she appreciated. Uh, she bought a few more things than last year. Uh, she also really liked the swing dancing track. <laughs> Uh, so or, there was a general ballroom dancing track, I guess, uh, by Heroes Lounge. And she went to at least one of those events and said that they were excellent. Uh, very good for introverts who are not used to interacting with other people. Uh, so very friendly, welcoming, and just a lot of fun. Mm. Um, on the panel front, I went to a bunch of panels. Um bunch of them did not stand out a lot. Um, there was one that was really terrible. That uh, that was the food and anime panel. And that one was just god awful. I think that has the record for the least amount of time I was able to stay in the room, which was like four minutes and I had to leave. It was just uh, <laughs> terrible. I did not. I, I knew I could not take it. Uh, and I went to the Gundam for Newbies panel, though, which was right next door, and that was pretty good. Uh, I haven't watched much Gundam, so they talked a lot about, you know, sort of a, there are three recommended different ways to get into the series. Hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, what else? Uh, the Kimono Fun panel on Sunday was quite good. Uh, there was a presenter uh, who just called herself Kimono Fun, and she was talking about how to tie uh, fancy obi knots. And uh, how to figure out how to tie an OB knot just by looking at a photograph of it. And that was uh, really good. And so she spent the, you know, the, the whole panel just uh, getting people up on stage and tying different knots on them. Hmm. And I think she'd done like eight or nine by the time the panel's finished. So I got a couple of photos of everybody lined up. <laughs> uh, so that was pretty cool. Uh, anything else? Uh, AMV contest was great. Um, I thought it was quite strong this year. A lot of good stuff, particularly in the last few sections. Bryce's was fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely a good job there. Thank you. Congratulations, uh, Bryce. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what else? A lot of um, manga there music was a, videos. So what was that? I said there's a lot of manga music videos this year, like more than usual. There's like three. I think. Yeah, right. and one yeah. of them actually took the top prize in mm-hmm. one of the sec- action, sections. Yeah. And I think this was the, was it the Soul Leader one, yes, I think. Yeah. That was yeah, the best yeah. one, so... And they, the the uh, animator or the video creator put a hell of a lot of effort into that. Um, there was a lot of lot more motion than you often see in the manga music videos. Uh, Bryce, um, what would you say? There were like four of those, I think, total three. in the contest. There were three, uh, three, um, I, think, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, oh, did they all get into the actual final cut? Three did. I don't know about because um, we when we did the pre screening, I thought there was at least three, if not more. I only remember the four or the three. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to look back. Um, but definitely worthwhile. Um, I think everything that won did a good job of winning. Uh, there were two um, Your Name videos that took first and second place in the uh, romance slash sentimental category. Uh, the one that took first definitely deserved it. I thought the second one, uh, particularly when we put it up next to the first one, was not as strong. I'm right with you on that one, sure. Yeah. yeah the soccer I... one won the whole thing. 
Uh, oh yeah. Well, you as soon as as soon as that one went up there, you knew that was going to take it. it. Was the Anime World Cup, and it was one <laughs> of these where the animator is is just you know pulling, uh, telling a, a story with characters pulled from all these different shows, you know, stitching them together into one madcap, um, you know, con- nice, yeah. continuity. And it had you know great arc to it, great drama, some funny moments, uh, you know, a, a point where everything stops and then starts up again, you know, psyching the audience out. Uh, so it got a lot of laughs. And, you know, as soon as you saw that one, you knew that was going to take Best in the Show. And sure enough, to no one's surprise, it did. The Gretzigo one was good. Uh, Which the one? one? The Gretzigo one I thought was pretty funny, too, for a comedy. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah that, one was, that one was excellent, for sure. And I think that one, did that one take the top in comedy? I think the Jack Black one actually took the top. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I, that, that one was definitely well. an, in, a, a pleaser. But I think the Gretzigo one, yeah, uh, much yeah it was, I, I could have gone either way. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, but uh, hung out with uh, you know Bryce and Albert a bit. That was cool. Hung out with some other friends from the work anime club at my last job. That was cool. Uh, a bunch of the guys there wanted to learn how to play mahjong. And this year in the uh, in the game room, the video game room, they also had uh, the Washington Mahjong Club. Oh, that's pretty cool. Had a bunch cool. of uh, uh, just. Um, um, playing surfaces set up with Japanese Mahjong sets. That's cool. And that was cool. So we were able to just go over and spend, you know, a couple hours learning how to, uh, teaching them how to play Mahjong. Yay! And uh, somebody else dropped in who already knew how to play. So we had all uh, four, four people. And yeah, it's fun. I mean, Mahjong is a little hard, sort of hard to get into because there's so many things you need to wrap your mind around. But then once you've sort of played a couple of rounds, you're like, oh, this is not actually that hard. Mm-hmm. It's just there's like no easy way to start the explanation. You just have to start going around the table, and then it's like, oh yeah, this is this is pretty basic pattern matching when you get down to it. I see, uh, but still fun, and it's uh, definitely hard to find people to play mahjong with you around here. So uh, it was a good opportunity. So the more people you train, the more chance you'll have to play. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, so but it was a, a good con. Um, I had a great time. Um, yeah. Excellent. Awesome. Um, okay, so anything else to talk about before we uh, run the break or whatever? Not too much. I guess the one thing I'll mention is that uh, my wife and I were talking about Initial D briefly mm-hmm. on the way back because uh, there were some initial Initial D machines in the video game room, <laughs> and uh, one of my friends from the Work Anime Club were, was playing it. And so she was a little, little interested in it, so we watched one of the new Initial D movies. Oh. Uh, a couple of years back, there were uh, three movies released that sort of retell the first stage of Initial D. They got, you know, sort of cleaned up plot, cleaned up uh, animation, but it's still Initial D. So, mm-hmm. um, so we watched the first of those, and she liked it. Said she'd watch the other two. Okay. Yep, that's it though. Okay. Um, then I, I guess what we'll probably do is we'll run right to break we'll be back in just a moment with this week's topic i'm matt pison and you're listening to otaku generation shame on you and we are back from break with this week's topic which is dororo say that five times fast yes (laughs) uh okay so where shall we start and what do we need to know uh we should talk about its origins because this originally started out way back in 1969 Mm -hmm. actually 1967 um, as a manga created by the godfather of anime and manga, Osamu Tezuka. Yeah. Um, the plot is basically the same across all versions. You have um, a warrior in the Warring States period who is basically born deformed with no skin, face, or limbs because of a horrible demonic pact that his father, an ambitious warlord, made with demons. Yeah. And the plot of the of the series overall is that he's wandering throughout Japan tracking down these demons and slaying them to regain the stolen parts of his body. So, um Paul, I watched the first one from 1969, the animated mm-hmm. one. Um, yeah. How close is that related to what we see because obviously the, the first episode and the second episode already um, they sort of split on the concept already, and I didn't watch episode two or any additional of 1969. Is the is the plot similar? Because they don't get that deep into it in the first one from 1969. 
I'd say yes. I haven't watched all of the 1969 series either. Um, it's uh, It sort of splits the difference between the manga and the anime, but I'd say it sort of tends to be a little closer to the, that is the 2019 anime. And so it sort of ends up, I'd say, being a little closer to the 2019 anime. Um, the there are only like four volumes in the original manga, which is a little surprising, uh, given that they managed to get a 26 episode uh, anime out of it. Uh, so they really sort of um, take their time with the telling of a story in the 1969 version. Uh, they dial back on some of the almost wackiness in the in the manga. Uh, the manga has kind of a has sort of an offhand tone to it, I'd say, and it has that very Tezuka uh, sort of Disney-esque facial design in a lot of it. Uh, the character of Hyakimaru in the manga is uh, very brash right from the start, and he's talking up a storm. Uh, you know, he knows exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. And um, by the time we get to the 2019 anime, it's a much more refined take on the story. And Hyaki Maru, uh, this this kid who was, you know, had his had had his, has in, had his entire body basically sacrificed to the demons, um, you know, is basically he can't see, he can't uh, move even until he's given. You know these sort of puppet-like prosthetics by a a artisan slash healer. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing you guys may just believe on that the the prosthetics in this world are very good considering the time period <laughs> they're currently in. Yes, <laughs> so we've got to get past that part. But yeah, he's yeah. he's like leaping around <laughs> on wooden legs and and just doing all variety of like extremely sophisticated combat moves. Which is fine. And wh whisking his hands away with swords underneath it. Yeah. And oh yeah, that's that's one of the uh, the gimmicks of the show is that he has prosthetic arms. But when he goes into battle, he will, he will sort of like shuck off the forearms and reveal sword blades underneath. Yeah. So he's just leaping in around in the air and doing backflips and then slashing with his arms at, at the demons. Right. Um, another thing that changed is in the original Tezuka manga, there were 48 demons, which I guess is like em emblematic of like all the provinces of Japan right. or something. Oh, okay. So he would go to like every province in Japan, slay the demon there and... That would get him parts of his body back, but it sort of is a little more understandable in the 2019 anime because uh, it was only 12 demons in this one, and I'm sort of thinking like, well, geez, if you're swaying 48 demons to get your body parts back, I mean, you're getting back like, you know, like one finger <laughs> for every demon you yeah. slay or something. So it's it's a little more realistic to assume that he's only being chopped up into 12 pieces for the, right. new, the newer <laughs> series. Um, so Yakamaru does encounter in the other principal character, the title character, Dororo, mm -hmm. who is a, a kid who has probably seen some tough times, uh, an orphan, and he's introduced, uh, I guess, sort of, he's cheated out of uh, these guys out of their goods, and he's, just, you know, he's a troublemaker, you know, he's on the streets, yeah. living life, getting by, <laughs> not afraid to steal or cheat or... <laughs> trick people. Uh, yeah. You gotta do what you gotta do. The, this is the Warring States period, and one of the the big themes um, they're conveying in the new anime is that war is hell, and it's not just war, war is hell for the soldiers. It's miserable all around for everybody. Yeah. Um, because this lord wants to be more powerful, he makes a pact with demons. He sacrifices his firstborn son to a horrible, miserable life and then floats him away in a little boat on the river to die. And all throughout um, this series, as our hero defeats more of these demons, the, the luck and fortune that this warlord has been enjoying for all these years is slowly being whittled away piece by piece because, you know, these demons are being killed and when he reclaims his body parts, the demons are no longer bound by the pact to give good fortune to this warlord. So the more this guy regains of his body, the worse off the the territory of this warlord becomes. Wait, I, that, I do want to say, like, I think that, <laughs> I don't think Daigo did the right thing, this is the warlord, or the, mm -hmm. you know, but, like, he did have his 
his providence, the people of his providence in mind when he did this. It's not just like he has good fortune, his entire mm-hmm. land has good fortune. I'm not going to say here, like, oh, that justifies it. It doesn't, but it makes him seem a little less... It's not so black and white. Like, it's not like... He's yeah, like purely really bad, evil like, and I ambitious. I just want money and blah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's, you know, he does have some in- good intentions in mind, I think. Maybe his means don't justify his ends. <laughs> yeah, there's... Yeah, yeah, there's, I, I there's... think one of the themes of this show is that anything you want corrupts you if you want it too hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's it's uh, it's the it's the clarification that it's not money that is the root of all evil. It is love of money that is the root of mm. all evil. Yep. And uh, basically there's, there's always a cost for doing anything. Um, there's, there's one episode where you find a young girl who is taking care of a bunch of orphans because there are tons and tons of orphans just dying in the streets, literally, in, in the Warring States period. And she's protecting these orphans. Unfortunately, it's by going off and, quote, working at an army camp at night. For the soldiers, yeah. uh, which the kids are, are a little too young and naive to really understand what she's earning money by doing, but it's this horrible thing where she's 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 basically selling herself to to provide for these horrible orphan these horrible you know orphan children, and it's it's just not a good scene. Um, everything you do has a cost, it seems, to somebody else. So, uh, I yeah, this, so oh, sorry, I was actually going to say one one thing to note is that I would say this is probably a little earlier than the Sengoku period. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't have any of the usual trappings of the well-known Sengoku era warlords. Mm-hmm. I mean, so you don't have the you know the the struggle for the shogun's throne or anything. This the the, the conflicts seem much more localized. This is mm-hmm. you know a border struggle between two provinces. Mm-hmm. Okay, but um, it's but it's still the Warring States period, even if it's not the climax of the Warring States mm. period. Uh, yeah, and actually, if I knew more about the costuming, we I could probably pin it down. They had some very distinctive hats they were wearing. I have to say that oh, would okay. probably let you uh, let you um, nail it right down. Um, but yes, so in addition to you know just sort of the practicalities of wanting things, there are also sort of these supernatural uh, consequences where uh, people get involved with demons in various ways. Uh, mm-hmm. So a lot of this show has sort of not a, not a strictly episodic structure, but it will be sort of like a monster of the week or a monster of the two weeks uh, where there's, um, you know, some vengeful spirit uh, and you typically a human that's associated in some way with that spirit who's been corrupted by it or. Mm-hmm. is enthralled to it or some way or has just you know been so badly damaged that they've sort of adopted the spirit's motivations as their own yeah um that's a continual um theme in the episodes that i saw which was any truck with demons just inevitably corrupts human beings um there's a guy who if is forced to take up a cursed sword and it's of course cursed in that it requires blood to sustain itself so he is forced to kill people to sate the bloods the bloodlust of this sword and eventually even when he is like deprived of the sword later it's got its hooks into him so deeply that he doesn't go seeking it but he doesn't try and avoid it afterwards it it he just sort of sits there fatalistically waiting for whatever unfortunate person the sword um, gloms onto next to return it to him, um, like like a horrible addiction. And there's a, a village where a demon is slaying travelers, and the villagers are so hard up for money that it's like, okay, we'll let innocent travelers be slain by our demon and live off the drop loot, Um because that's better than being eaten by the demon ourselves. Eek. And uh, and and that's per- portrayed somewhat ambiguously as well. I mean, it's it's uh, you know these these people are not considered as sort of irrevocably depraved. It's more that this is a choice they've made, and they they say explicitly, "What else were we supposed to do?" 
Yeah, that's that's the horrible thing. It, this is a world where people are just doing um, sad, terrible things just to survive. And when you get to the root of it, it's like their their whole thing is, what else could we do? It was this or die. So it's death or degradation all around. Um, it's a grim scene, definitely. Grim, <laughs> yeah, a grim uh, backdrop, but not dark all the time for sure. Like, there's definitely yeah. well, well, that's moments and yeah, that is the bright side mm-hmm. to all of this is that it's um, companionship and human virtues that allow you to get through these horrible situations, and that's kind of the the subtle theme of this show is that this is a terrible world. It's at war. It's infested by demons. Things are so bad. People are doing the most, you know, extreme things to survive. But yet, it's not. It's not totally falling into depravity. It's just terrible, terrible hardship on everyone. And it's the the human qualities of of hope and <coughs> and and self reliance and companionship that that allow you to get through these horrible situations without becoming depraved. And uh, the sort of that journey is the overall arc of this story, because as Hyakimaru kills more and more demons and eventually more and more people on his quest to regain all of his body parts, he becomes more and more demonic and his, you know, desire to, you know, just get his, you know, his eyes and his hands back is causing, you know, massive destruction. And so when he kills these demons and, you know, these villagers who also have been, you know, feeding, you know, passing travelers to them, they're left with nothing. They're going to die because they can't feed themselves anymore. Mm. And, you know, that's left effectively unresolved. I mean, this is just the consequence of this world. Yeah, and I guess the one tether that keeps Yakamaru from going, you know, becoming a demon himself really ends up being Dororo, and mm-hmm. they have a really good relationship, I think. they kind of like a brother relationship. Uh, yeah, the uh, the interesting thing about this relationship is that um, Yakamaru saved Dororo from, from like, being, well, basically killed for, for his crimes, mm-hmm. ripping people off, but afterwards they travel as a team, and it works out beneficially for both of them because... Hyakumaru keeps Dororo from getting killed by the warring state's miserableness. And on the other hand, he's somebody who can sort of like smooth over the social situations. And he's like, oh yeah, this is Hyakumaru. He's, you know, deaf and blind and he hunts demons. And people would be like, oh, okay, so that's his deal. As opposed to what the hell is this fell creature stumbling out of the, the woods in this terrible time. Mm-hmm. And I think it, it saves a lot of people from getting killed by him. Because if, if he had just been wandering around by himself, he'd basically just slice down anybody who fucked with him, and that would be the end of you. Mm-hmm. Um, so on the one hand, it's a mutually beneficial relationship, but also I think it gives Hyakumaru some like baseline human companionship. Somebody to, to sort of keep him in touch with with social norms and being a real person and mm. you know preventing him from just like staggering around doing nothing but demon slaying all with all of his hours mm-hmm. so i i think it's uh it's a nice um link to to normal humanity for him because you know comfortably numb demon slayer is not exactly a great way to go through life <laughs> And Dororo is a is is basically set up as the one good character in this show. Well, maybe one of two good characters. Uh, the other one who is unambiguously good is sort of this monk who travels around with a biwa loot on his back and is kind of the, you know, the the wise voice who just happens to cross paths with him way too frequently. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, like like Hyakimaru, he's blind and can see the souls of people. Yeah. And can you know offer insight into demons and Yakibaru's sort of uh, the dangers he's running as he kills more and more. Mm-hmm. And uh, but s- those two characters are sort of the voice of, you know, of of humanity. Um, you know, the, the the monk from sort of a place of experience and Dodo from a place of innocence. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it. Um, and yeah, and 
you're asking yourself, how does um, Hirakimaru go around and slay these demons when he can't see, feel, or hear? And the answer is because he can see auras, or I guess the, the anima that is inside living things. Um, you know, trees have faint anima because they're sort of vegetative living things. Animals have slightly higher orders. People have self-aware moral orders, so they burn, so they show up the brightest. And then there's the demons who are just chock full of supernatural power, so they are both bright and um, red to to distinguish them from like the relatively innocent human beings. <coughs> Um, so I thought this series is very well paced. Um, I think they do a good job of going to the Monster of the Week style story, but always you know bringing it back to the main story, which is Hikamaru trying to get his body back while Daigo and Daigo's other son, Hikamaru's brother, mm. um, who want to stop him because if he keeps getting all his body parts back, the domain's going to probably is starting to deteriorate with yeah. famine, locusts, all like that good all stuff. the good weather they've enjoyed <laughs> stops coming, all their victory in battles starts coming harder and harder and they start losing battles and there's also a backstory to Dororo that kind of intersects along the way like his past his father and mother um how they died and what you know they left behind and people from that from his past as a tachi guy who i guess is sort of like another kind of antagonist who also kind of like he desires money so much that it ends up corrupting him and making him do things he shouldn't be doing and I think it really intersects well. <laughs> it does, you know, it's never overtly like Atachi never meets Daigo, but it doesn't really have to go that way. I like that. Yeah, but they're they're both clearly like on the opposite sides of this battle. Mm-hmm. The one is struggling to preserve his father's horrible demon <sighs> demon bargain, even though he doesn't really know about it at first. The son, yeah, yeah, he just suspects that there's like some big secret that his mother and father are keeping from him, but he. I don't think does he figure it out later in he the does, series? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, he becomes kind of like the the main guy that the big fights happen with him. Yeah. <laughs> so it's more so than Daigo, I would say, by the end. Yeah, because yeah, he's and, the lord of the territory, and it's like the captain really should not go on landing party expeditions. And uh, I, I have to say, his arc is done very well uh, because he starts off as clearly an idealistic character and an innocent. And then there's a moment when he makes a, a deliberate choice that he, like his father, is going to do whatever it takes. Mm-hmm. And at that point, he becomes, you know, a mostly implacable antagonist who still, you know, has moments where, you know, he, he sort of feels the cost that he's chosen to pay. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, structurally speaking, I think this show is really well done. Uh, there's sort of a, a turning point in the middle where it switches from the sort of the, the spirit of the week uh, type of thing to a bit more of a buildup. Uh, things start to take more than one episode. Um, uh, the uh, plots start carrying over until it finally builds, builds up into and toward the final uh, climactic confrontation. Which definitely, those are fun confrontations. The animation was quite nice on those battles, for sure. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I, actually, just and, about everything yeah. in this series was a pleasure to, to watch, experience, um, listen to. Um, this, this um, I, w- I was really surprised uh, by, the, by just you know, the, the, the sheer um, uniformity of the execution all the way through. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was I was watching it back when it was coming out uh, weekly, but then I sort of took a break and then ended up watching much more. And then a few weeks later, I finished it up for this show, and I loved it. I thought it was really good. Um, not a lot of people talking about it. I felt like though, like I, you know, there were no AMVs to it, nothing like that. I know it was like kind of a pretty strong season with like Promise Neverland and stuff, but I don't know. I thought this would be a really popular one, and maybe it is. I just haven't seen a lot of people talking about it. <laughs> In a way, you know. yeah, it's not like a flashy shonen show. No, it's I mean not. it has you know a very it's very full on historical character to it. Um, you know, it's got the demons and it's got the magic, um, but it's um, I you know it's not a, a flighty or, yeah. or or frivolous series. I I think the the reason it's not a, a broader hit is that it doesn't romanticize the Warring States period. Um, no. Because I'm thinking of like a lot of other shows, like maybe Ninja Scroll, where there were demons lurking about, but it was always like really cool demons, and it was sensualized, and there was this like 
um, hyping up of the <laughs> demons where it was always surrounded by like you know hot naked chicks yeah. and demons yeah. whereas in this one the the only time you would ever expect to see a naked chick is if she's being like slaughtered by samurai yeah. or raped or something yeah um so this is i think this is for all the supernatural elements kind of a a gritty a gritty and realistic uh look at the warring states period and it's uh it's it's not like hyping it up to say it was like war and chaos and oh there's demons and war and chaos it's and like, heroes and <laughs> yeah it's uh it's it's like this is a miserable awful situation and we're just going to have to hack our way through it to redemption at the end of it somehow and uh and I, I think that's why it's not more more broadly appreciated because it is a pretty grim, dark mm. world. Yeah, mm. I mean, it's a hard sell until you. I would say if you sit down and watch it, though, you might start getting into it. It's hard to sell it like to somebody describing it. So. I don't know. I mean, between you and Paul, would you guys get up to like twenty episodes? I watched the whole thing at twenty four. Uh, I yeah. actually was watching the whole thing uh, right before we finished recording. Oh, here. okay. I, mm-hmm. I finished the last episode. Yeah. Uh, because it was so good, I wanted to make sure I made it all the way through. Uh, to before we talked about it and uh, yeah I mean this um, is one of the best series I've seen in quite a while I have to say yeah Um, but if you're expecting sort of a a fantasy world where you've got you know this teenage long blonde hair you know white vestments with lots of cleavage priestess who who like does idol transformations (laughs) and sparkly magic this is not the show for you right which is basically all the you know, the kind of shows that we've been getting yeah. to talk about this it's, period It's time. the sort of thing that you'd find in one of these isekai fantasy world shows. Yep. This is but not It's that. also not a grim dark show, though, which I think is worth pointing out. There's some series that are just dark for the sake of being dark. Um, and this is not that. I mean, there there are definitely moments of relief. I mean, there's there's hope throughout the series. There's the idea that there can be something more and sort of the overall arc of the uh, show bears that out, I'd say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Bryce, how would you sort of compare the feel of this show to something like Vinland Saga? Um, I don't know, actually. Uh, I guess Vinland Saga doesn't have the supernatural elements to it, as far as I know, sure. from what I've read. Um, it's pretty much straight up Vikings warring. Um, I haven't really read enough of it to fully compare it. The, um. But I would say, well, in Vinland Saga, the main kid who I think ends up becoming like this really bloody war, you know, uh, mercenary later on. So mm-hmm. he's not, doesn't really compare to Doro in that way. Uh, but I can see people liking both for sure. Like someone who likes Vinland Saga would want to maybe watch this as well. Have you seen much Vinland Saga beyond the first episode? Paul? Nope. I just watched the first episode okay. and I get sort of, it feels very different um, in, in just from the first two episodes of these. Sure. Uh, and, it, and I was trying to put my finger on why, and I'm not quite sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's sort of a, an implacability to Vinland Saga where, you know, there's just going to be lots of blood and teeth everywhere. True. Yeah. Uh, well, in, in Dororo, there's, there's blood, but the blood kind of isn't the main point. You know, right. there's going to be blood, but it's much more about, you know, is this character going to pull through the darkness or not? And pulling through the darkness is actually a possibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's not... Yeah, Dororo is violent for sure, um, but it's not in a way... Like that first episode of Villain Saga, that when you throw that chain around that guy's head and like pull it away and like oh, rip yeah. it off his head, like, that was that was pretty brutal. Um, not to say that brutal stuff doesn't happen in Dororo, but it's not quite as what the word is yeah it's it's more like a slash and gouts yeah. of blood everywhere like on the ground but and <laughs> yeah yeah but but it's not like something like um uh what's the uh, i can't can't recall the samurai show that i'm thinking of that's just you know just total uh like gore fest. Maybe this isn't the gore of? fest what was that basilic maybe you're thinking of nope okay. nope uh, it'll it'll come to me yeah. um but um yeah. So, um, yeah, this is um, something that's definitely you'd want to watch before you decide if you want to watch with your kid, I would yeah, say. Yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah, I recommend it. Uh, the openings, I guess we thought we agreed with the first openings better than the second opening. As much as I like Asian Kung Fu Generation, that first opening was pretty cool. <laughs> like, just more interesting visually and, I don't know, felt like a better song. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Uh, the endings were fine, but they were kind of not present. Yeah, I kind of skipped them mostly. 
but I watched it a couple times. Uh, I didn't really notice incidental music a lot while I was watching through this. It may have been there, but it wasn't really like a prominent part of the show. Yeah. Um, but and this is a big difference from the 1969 anime, where <laughs> there is just it's sort of um, you know swaddled in classical Japanese music all the way through, which contributes to the the feel of the pacing, uh, which I think is one of the real strengths of the the uh, the original anime. Yeah, I watched uh, the opening for the original anime, and that's a very totally uh, different thing. But it's totally also like Duro, yeah. like in the opening, like Duro seems to be kind of a bigger jerk than he is in the. In, I didn't watch the uh, episode though, but like he's just walking along, as other guys walking next to him, and he just throws a tomato in the guy's face and runs away. Like, why'd you do that? <laughs> you know, I, yeah, eat the tomato if yeah, you're starving. Yeah. <laughs> why would you throw it? But yeah, totally. I'd say that the. Uh... That the 2019 da, 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 is more consistent, mm -hmm. um, and it really feels like they wanted to do this story right. They wanted to do it right for modern audiences, while still capturing sort of the reason the source material is interesting, rather than trying to you know perfectly recreate right. the original manga or you know make a uh, sort of uh, beat for beat recreation of the the 2019 story. Uh, excuse me, the 1969 story. Uh, there's lots of changes that have been done to just even you know the monsters that they chose to include, um, and in fact to the the major arc of the story and how it wraps up. Uh, there is a major revelation that I guess uh, maybe at this point I don't know if we'll we'll spoil or not. Um, but um, it's sort of presented as like a whoa twist at the very end of the 1969 series, oh, okay. whereas it's revealed quite early around episode nine, I think, in yeah. the 2019 series oh, and yeah. is sort of, you know, and I think that was a really good choice, the way it sort of informs the rest of the series all the way up to the end. Mm -hmm. I agree. And makes the, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just agreeing. Uh, which means that if you don't want to be spoiled, don't go and read the Wikipedia page because it is all over that Wikipedia page. Naughty, naughty Wikipedia. Indeed, indeed. Okay, um, some links. Uh, it's available on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Uh, oglink.com slash 4GF. That will take you over there. Um, there is a Wikipedia page that I did link it to, uh, oglink.com for GG. Obviously, according to Paul, don't read it. Okay. Um, if you want things ruined, then obviously read it. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. We should also mention, uh, just to mm -hmm. hype the 1960s series, that it has been released on DVD in its entirety. It's, oh, it really? uh, cool. uh, yes, it's available from Right Stuff. And wherever finer animes are sold, list price is uh, forty nine ninety five, but it looks like Right Stuff has it for thirty eight bucks. Hmm. Okay. Um, although it is apparently quote out of stock, expecting more. Hmm. Interesting. So I would gladly buy the Blu-ray for this series, the twenty nineteen series. They put a Blu-ray out for sure because yeah, I like I'm, I'm sure <laughs> that when the the twenty nineteen series gets a little bit older, it'll it'll see a home video release. Sure, probably and, by the holiday. Yeah, we'd recommend picking it up when hmm. that happens. Um, and, and just for reference, the samurai anime that I was trying to remember was Shig Shigurui Death Frenzy. Okay, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, if you want a lot of samurais, uh, really unpleasant samurais whacking each other with swords and blood flying everywhere, that is a show for you, I, I will tell you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, probably not me. Um, okay, anything else, guys? No, I think it's a cool series. No. Yeah, watch that. Watch this show. I mean, watch this show. I mean, if you don't like it after a couple episodes, you know, that's fine. But I really think this is worthwhile. This is this is good stuff. Yeah, yeah definitely. At least give it a try. Okay. All right. Well, then, um, I guess it's it's time to wrap up. So, for all the things we've mentioned, please visit our website, www.takugeneration.net or ognetworks.tv. For feedback, you can always hit us up. Um, go into Discord, oglink.com slash feedback. That'll take you over there. If you want to become a supporter, you can do that. oglink.com slash Patreon. Um, and uh, what are we going to do next week? Good question. I'm not sure that we know yet, but it'll be on Wednesday because that's when we podcast. Um, okay, so what do we got, Matt, for uh, our fortune? Ah, uh, yes. This week's fortune cookie to guide you through the upcoming week is 
If you want to succeed in business, avoid business as usual. Mm. Mm. Okay. It's deep. It's deep. Well, steep. Steep. Steep or deep? But deep. <laughs> deep. Uh, okay. I guess, uh, I don't know. There's not much more to say. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you guys next week. See you next week. Thanks for listening.